There is nothing Islam could do to make their terrorist nature more obvious. Bukhari, when Allah's apostle fought the battle of Kabar, or when he raided any other people, they raised their voices, crying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar! None has the right to be worshipped except Allah. Muslims will continue to terrorize until every soul submits to Islam. On that, Allah's apostle said, Lower your voices, for you are not calling a deaf or absent one, but a hearer who is with you. On that he said to me, O Abdallah, shall I tell you a sentence, which is one of the treasures of paradise? I said, Yes, O Allah's apostle, let my father and mother be sacrificed for your sake. What an utterly perverse and odd thing to say. He said, It is, that neither might nor power, but with Allah. Then why, pray tell, did he require militants to kill and pillage for him? To body and Ishak. So Muhammad began seizing their herds and their property bit by bit. He conquered Kabar home by home. The first stronghold defeated was Naim. Next was Kumus, the community of Abi Hukaik. The messenger took some of its people captive, including Safia bit Huye, the wife of Kinana, and her two cousins. The prophet chose Safia for himself. Perverted is too kind a word for this man. He became the first serial rapist to call himself a prophet. And make no mistake, having sex with a captive is rape. Tabari. Dia asked the messenger for Safia when the prophet chose her for himself. Muhammad gave Dia her two cousins instead. It was a two-for-one deal. The prophet could be so considerate. Ishak, when Dia protested, wanting to keep Safia for himself, the apostle traded for Safia, giving Dia her two cousins. The women of Kabar were distributed among the Muslims. Muhammad had men killed so that he could have sex with their wives and with their daughters. He traded human beings. And the Prophet rewarded his Muslim militants by distributing the remaining women among them. Then faced with this problem, Muhammad used some magic to turn rape into an approved Islamic act. The sleight of hand was called the mut'ah. It's a three-day marriage giving he and his militants a license to do with their prisoners whatever they pleased. But on this day, only the prophet's indiscretion was approved. Bukhari, on the day of Kebar, Allah's apostle forbade the muta, or temporary marriage. Bukhari, the prophet had their men killed, their children and women taken as captives. Safia was amongst the captives. She first came in the share of Diya, but later on she came to belong to the Prophet. Muhammad made her manumission. Webster defines manumission as a medieval word signifying the authority of a master to release one from slavery. As her maher, or wedding gift. Translated into common English, Muhammad performed some Islamic hocus-pocus to make non-consensual sex seem moral. And that's all Islam ever was. It was just an act, an Oscar-winning performance by one of the great con artists of all time. The Bukhari tradition winds down with these words. The captives of Kibar were divided among the Muslims. Then the messenger began taking their homes and property that were closest to him. The prophet was busy establishing Islamic sunnah, or custom on this day. Ishak, the apostle prohibited four things the morning of the Kibar raid. Carnal intercourse with pregnant women who were captured, mingling his seed with another man's. Which means the Muslims were free to rape those who weren't pregnant nor is it lawful for him to take rape her until she is in a state of cleanliness, not menstruating, something that bothered Muhammad enormously. Nor can a Muslim eat the flesh of donkeys, nor eat any carnivorous animal, nor sell any booty before it has been duly allotted. That's because the Prophet took his cut 
off of the top, and he didn't want his cut diminished. The tradition continues to lay down the law. Nor is it lawful for a Muslim to ride an animal belonging to the booty with the intention of returning it to the pool when he has worn it out. Nor is it lawful for him to wear a garment belonging to the booty of the Muslims with the intention of returning it to the pool of stolen goods when he has reduced it to rags. If you desire to be a pirate, I suppose these might be words to live by. Ishak, on the day of Kibar, the apostle forbade us to buy or sell gold ore for gold coin, or silver ore for silver coin. And that's because he who controls the bank, the means of commerce and trade, controls men by way of their wallets. Before we leave this rather dismal attempt to establish Islamic law, I want to solve the perplexing donkey conundrum. It's no small matter to Muslims. There were no fewer than a dozen Bukhari hadith from this day alone focused on the lowly ass. Let's see if we can figure out why. Bukhari On the day of Kibar, Allah's apostle forbade the eating of garlic and the meat of donkeys. That wasn't much help. All it did was demonstrate that Muhammad was a fool. Garlic is nature's best antibiotic, and thus should be consumed. But Muhammad wasn't much of a medicine man. This trio of prescriptions tell the tale. Bukhari. The climate of Medina did not suit some of the people, so the Prophet ordered them to drink camel urine as a medicine. And when that made them even sicker, he said, Bukhari. I heard Allah's apostles saying, There is healing in black cumin for all diseases except death. Unless we forget. Bukhari, Allah's apostle said, If a fly falls in your drink, dip all of it in the cup and then throw it away, for in one of its wings there is a disease, and in the other there is healing and antidote or treatment for that disease. But foolish did not make him frivolous. The next tradition provides a clue as to why he was so upset. Bukhari. Someone came to Allah's apostle and said, Donkeys have been eaten by Muslims. The prophet kept quiet. The man again said, Their donkeys have been eaten. The prophet kept quiet. After the third time, the prophet ordered his caller to announce, Allah and his apostle forbid you to eat the meat of donkeys. Then the cooking pots were overturned while the meat was still boiling in them. I discovered this clue when I read Bukhari, Volume 5, Book 59, Number 531. We were afflicted with severe hunger the day we raided Kabar. When the cooking pots were boiling and the food was ready to eat, the announcer of the prophet said, Do not eat anything, especially the donkey meat. Turn your cooking pots upside down and throw it away. We realized that the prophet had prohibited such food because the kumis had not been taken out of it. The kumis is the prophet's share of all booty seized by Muslim militants. The donkeys belonged to the Jews. They were beasts of burden used to till the fields and carry crops to market. Thus they were a spoil to be divided, with Muhammad getting the largest share. And he would rather see his people starve than renounce his claim to stolen property. The first Islamic historian and biographer each report a hadith along the same lines. Tabari and Ishak, the Banu Sam of Aslam, newly recruited Muslim militants, came to the messenger and complained, Muhammad, we have been hurt by drought and possess nothing. Although they had fought for the prophet, they found he had nothing. He was willing to give them. The apostle said, O oh Allah, you know their condition. I have no strength and nothing I want to give them from the booty I have stolen. So conquer for them the wealthiest of the Kabar homes, the one with the most food and fat meat. In other words, steal your own booty. You'll starve before I share any of my confiscated wealth with you. Mm -hmm. 